I think we can start now, Bishop. I'm all set. Yes. I'm all yours. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to Development Discourse with Patrick in conversation with His Most Reverend Excellency Matthew Kuka, Bishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Sokoto in Nigeria. Bishop Kuka is one of Nigeria's most relevant public intellectuals. He studied philosophy and theology at the St. Augustine Major Seminary in Jos and was ordained Catholic priest about 44 years ago. Uh, he has a diploma in religious studies from University of Ibadan and a Bachelor of Divinity degree from the Pontifical Urban University, Rome. He has a master's degree in peace studies from University of Bradford and a PhD from SOAS, University of London. He's a senior Rhodes Fellow at St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford, and an Edward Mason Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Bishop Kuka has held very important and sensitive national and international positions. I'll mention just a few um, that may be relevant to the topics we will cover today. He was a member of the Human Rights Violation Investigation Commission, Secretary, National Co Political Conference 2005, Chairman Ogoni Shell Reconciliation 2005 to present, Member Electoral Reform Committee, Chairman Committee on Interreligious Dialogue, Catholic Bishops Conference Nigeria 2012 to present, Member Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue Vatican City 2012 to present, Chairman Committee on Interreligious Dialogue Regional Episcopal Conference of West Africa. From this very vantage position, he has closely interrogated many national issues over the last three to four decades. And these analyses have yielded several books and scores of essays. Witness to Justice, an insider account of Nigeria's Truth Commission 2011, Religion, Culture, and Politics of Development 2007, The Church and the Politics of Social Responsibility, Whistling in the Dark, Democracy and Civil Society in Nigeria, Religion and Politics of Justice in Nigeria, Religion, Religious Militancy and Self-Assertion, Islam and Politics of Nigeria, Religion, Politics and Power in Northern Nigeria. This conversation today seeks to explore the many centrifugal forces uh, pulling Niger Nigeria apart and the possibility of reversing them. Bishop Kuka, you are welcome to this chat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kibbo. It's a great pleasure. I think you've dressed me in borrowed robes. First, I'm an ordinary bishop. And secondly, uh, uh, Sokoto is just a small, it's an ordinary diocese. Uh, but thank you very much. You've been most generous. But Sokoto, the diocese of Sokoto covers like three because, states. Well, I mean, from the point of view of land space, uh, we, we, we are probably one of the biggest dioceses in uh, in, uh, in, in Africa and uh, perhaps the world. We are 108,000 square kilometers. Uh, we cover four states. So if we are running a feudal state, that would be an extraordinarily rich, or if these guys were paying their rents, <laughs> we should be one of the richest uh, estates in, uh, in Nigeria. I hear you, I hear you. I will get into that. But first of all, let me again uh, commiserate with you um, on the death of your mother uh, two weeks ago and also to thank you for, despite what you must be going through at the moment, uh, being gracious enough you know, to still honor this invitation. Uh, my deepest condolences, sir. Thank you very much. And let me use this medium to also thank you and thank uh, millions of Nigerians for, for their extraordinary graciousness. I mean, I, I, I didn't imagine that uh, I will receive this kind of outpouring of emotions uh, and the guests that turned up. But, I thought that this was not, uh, I had to honor this uh, invitation and um, life has to go on. So really, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so let me just jump right into it. You're joining us from Kafanchan, um, a place that has been volatile for some time. Um, many lives were lost earlier this week in conflict. Um, is it fair to argue that the problems we see in places like Kafanchan and in many parts of the middle belt of Nigeria and increasingly even in the Southeast, um, are largely an economic problem that we have defined as a religious or a political. After all, we have Muslims you know, who cohabit with Christians in highbrow areas like Banana Island in Lagos, in Maitama, in Abuja, 
and they don't seem to have the kinds of conflict we find in local communities where we have uh, Muslims and Christians coexisting. What's your view on that? Well, thank you very much for asking a very complex question, which uh, I mean is the subject of it of many doctoral theses. Uh, but our inability to even define what is happening in Nigeria in totality um, suggests very clearly that we have been traveling on a road without maps, um, that the issue of our collective and individual and communal identities are still highly unresolved, undefined, uninterrogated, uh, that the issue of our common citizenship or even our existence in a nation, uh, most of all these are largely in suspended animation because they've never really been tabled for discussion. So we have a lot of the past that is still haunting us. Uh, and occasionally we have all these nightmares that we are unable to resolve because the persistence of this crisis and their escalation and the inability and willingness of the Nigerian state to come to terms with this crisis, because we've been consistent on this path for the better part of 30 years. Indeed, you can argue that since the Civil War, this country has really never known peace and stability because communal crises have been with us for as long as anyone can remember. It's just a question of what nomenclature you use whether there are riots on the streets. However, because of the overarching nature of, uh, of religious identity, such as Islam and Christianity, and their universal claims, um, these crises dwarf ethnic crises, but they are crises nonetheless. And they are evidence of the unresolved issues of the Nigerian state. Now, the, well, the first tragedy is our inability to define what we're dealing with. Uh, we have framed a lot of these crises as crises between Christians and Muslims. Uh, now we're talking about crises between pastoralists and, 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 and headsmen. Uh, and these, these half-hearted definitions that never define the problem lead us to almost the same conclusion with a wrong diagnosis and a wrong treatment and the consequences on the patient. I can say very clearly that First of all, our problems have never been subjected to enough inter intellectual interrogation to give us a clinical bill with which to deal with the problems of Nigeria. Now, if you speak today to the issues of the crisis we are facing in Southern Kaduna, these, have, these crises have been in gestation for a long time. And again, they are part of an, you know, a long history of unresolved narratives from the Sokoto Caliphate, the British colonialism, and the contradictions of military rule and the distortions of the Nigerian state. All of these have still come together. And if we, what we are witnessing in Nigeria is occasional busts here and there. Uh, but they speak to the larger issue that we still have a lot of unresolved problems. And we've not, I'm sorry to say, not even started on the road to building a nation, a viable nation that can serve as a platform for building an egalitarian, non-discriminatory society. So for me, the issues are deep, but they speak to the fact that, like I said, we've not been able to deal with the issues of religion in Nigeria, the issues of identity, and so on and so forth. So what we are witnessing in Southern Kaduna is just, is just symptomatic of the deeper issues. Mm. So you, you mentioned in your response the fact that we do not have a common understanding or a common definition of what Nigeria means for us. So some have argued that whilst we might have a Nigeria, as a country, we do not have Nigerians. It comes back again to the issue of identity. And there are many issues to unpack in just this one question, but you know, how would you, if you were to strip it down to the bare bones, taking just the problem in Southern Kaduna, not the whole of Nigeria, what would you locate to be the core of the problem? Because that could be a good jump off point to what the solution could be. I think, you know, there's a very, there are, you know, Part of the problem, which we have, and it's not peculiar to Southern Kaduna, is that we are dealing with a political elite that is governing Nigeria at various levels, that is almost totally ignorant of the ethno-cultural 
foundations of the society. So if you look at the literature preceding colonialism, for example, I mean, the British were extraordinarily uh, careful. A lot of the people who came as part of the colonial project were Oxford Cambridge scholars, but they also did a lot of anthropological ethnographical studies. So they understood even in creating provinces and so on and so forth. Now we have today many state governors who cannot tell you the number of ethnic or cultural groups that make up the state over which they preside. We have a lot of people in high office today who are purely and simply obsessed with what is happening at the center with total ignorance about the nature of the fears, the anxieties, the hopes, the aspirations of the various communities. So the result is that even to talk about, about Southern Kaduna is a bit of an oxymoron because it doesn't address the nature of the identities. As we are talking now, last night, up till almost midnight, I had a Fulani man who came to visit me and he's a very visible Fulani man. We sat, we, we chatted until almost midnight and I was joking with him. I said, look, how are you going to go home? And he says to me, he said, this is my territory. Now, and we talked about the same fears. We talked about the same anxieties. My mother was buried on Friday. On Saturday, before 2 p.m., I had three delegations of Fulanese who came in their tents to come and pay, to come and you know, condole with me. I'd never met them. I didn't know who they were. They came from different Fulani settlements. What I'm saying in effect is that what is happening to us in Southern Kaduna and many other parts of Nigeria does not reflect the realities around which our people are living. I have spoken to and I have visited and I've been and I, I have friends with quite a good number of these people. I know that they themselves feel almost totally helpless because they are victims of extraneous factors that are beyond their control. Now, who has the text? Who has the script? Who has the answers? I don't know. But I think that one of the tragedies in all this is that I do not see government, federal, state, deliberately, carefully trying to sift through the rubble to find out what exactly is happening. How are people hurting? Now, the fact that 20 people, 50 people, 60 people will be killed in a community, a governor is not present, his orderlies and his, his assistants are not present, the president has no message to a community, now, we've gone into this state of convulsion and we're literally dealing with our own situations in part because when you have a crisis of this nature, as you saw with George Bush 9-11, what a president, what a governor, what a public officer communicates to people in their moments of sorrow is so fundamental to the future. We don't see any of this happening. So people feel abandoned, they feel frustrated, and uh, it seems adds to the fears, it adds to the anxieties, and it adds to the tension. But ordinarily, with better navigational aids, we really don't need to be where we are now because 90% of ordinary people just want to be left alone. Ordinary Fulanese just want to be left alone to head their cattle and rear their cattle and so on. I agree with you. In one of your essays, um, you said that the failure that we're seeing is the failure of our leaders to, you know, be, to have the ability to manage the plurality we see in our society today. Um, in another essay, you were a bit uh, severe in your characterization of the Buhari administration as, in your words, bigoted with lopsided political appointments. Um, it is refreshing to see that it appears the new chief of staff agrees with that characterization. And that is why he has highlighted it as one of the issues he needs to deal with um, urgently. But what troubles me is what is it about today's Nigeria that has made it possible for such lopsided appointments to even happen in the first place? What should have happened? You know, what should happen going forward? You know, to ensure that we get out of this situation and that we never come back to this situation. Look, I, I, I am. I, I, I have never borne animosity towards anybody. I love this country very passionately. I believe that we ought not to be where we are. I don't believe that the people are necessarily leaders because leadership, holding office, we have office holders, we don't have leaders. 
all right? Because holding office as governor, as senator, as, I mean, these guys just emerge from nowhere. Because if you have, if you have, um, uh, if you have, a, if you are a leader, there will be a text, there will be a philosophy, there will be an ideology that people subscribe to. That, and they can run with that text independent of you. Now you may have a bit of hero worship here and there, but you know, the Buhari administration about which, you know, I had my own fears and anxieties, which I expressed very early on. And part of my anxiety was, I believe then as now that Buhari is a good man. I believe that he's a good man, but there are quite a lot of good people who are leading badly. Now, if, if, I don't think any of us could have ever believed that we would come to the point that we came to, including those who voted for Buhari in 2015, that we would end up with the kind of government that we've ended up in terms of its composition, which, is, which has been a great, a great to a good number of Muslims that I know. Now, the president, I mean, when I raise questions about all the talk about fighting corruption and so on and so forth. I am on record as letting the president know, even before he won the election, that fighting corruption in the way and manner that it was framed intellectually did not resonate with me. I, then as now, I don't believe that we have framed the issues of corruption properly because even the fact that from the, from the foundation of EFCC so-called up till today, that each and every one of the, of, the, of the chairman of EFCC has left in controversial circumstances, suggests so very clearly that you don't talk about fighting corruption because if you fight, somebody is gonna lose. When you talk about fighting co corruption in a highly convoluted environment like Nigeria, where corruption is top, bottom, the only thing working, then it means you don't understand how this country you know, is, is framed. So for me, if you ask, how did we come to the point that we are in? It speaks to the nature of the choices that we make. It also speaks to the nature of the capacity, of our capacity to interrogate individuals who want public office. This, if we are going to learn any, any lesson at all, and if we want to avoid sinking even deeper and getting worse than where we are now, it is to develop the ability not to look at a gift horse in the mouth, but to have anybody who wants to govern Nigeria answer certain critical questions. So far, the way the political class has behaved and the political class has been guilty of packaging individuals, never allowing them to answer questions, um, shopping them around from one stadium to the other, and then proceeding to manufacture results and presenting us with people that we don't know the antecedents. So I think that what all this means for Nigerians going forward is that from your local government chairman or, or councillor, Individuals must show a proper understanding of the problems that Nigerians face, as opposed to you know, electing people on grounds of messianic claims. So for me, if we are going to go forward, as opposed to going back, we ourselves must interrogate the nature of the choices that we made. Let me, I'm going to come to the issues of corruption and electoral reforms uh, you know, in a minute, but I wanted to just get a few things out of the way. Um, there's an increasing suspicion of a plan towards uh, ethnic hegemony of some sort. Uh, you talk to people, there's a fear of some grand plan of a Fulani domination of Nigeria. Um, as someone who deals with these issues, probably on a day-to-day, -day, um, is it based on any empirical evidence or is it just another urban myth that has just found a life of its own? Look, I mean, my PhD thesis, which became Religion, Politics, and Power, that was published in 1992. Actually, I'm working on a revised version, which will be published next year, to, because to expand the scope of the argument. Um, I mean, that book, in my view, and I'm not advertising here, should be, and I know it's fundamental reading for many people, because it addresses the issue of the, how, the nature, the character, and the formation of, of what I call Hausa Fulani hegemony. Now, um, I don't think that this ruling class is about to, 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 to do anything different. Uh, but I also think that we need to understand that there is a huge body of very educated northerners 
Muslims, Fulanis, Hausas, Nupes, all kinds of people who are desperate to move away from the shadow of a hegemonic north that is being presented as being unproductive, uh, being just a bunch of blood suckers who are producing nothing for the country. They are anxious to create a more egalitarian society that creates greater respectability for religion, a, a greater you know, a, you know, society going forward. I believe that Buhari and, and some of the people like him who are in their late 70s and 80s represent the last of the, of the wine of Northern hegemony. Now, whether anybody likes it or not, the end of Buhari's tenure is gonna mark a defining moment for Northern Nigeria. And I think that the rest of Nigeria must therefore be ready to open up conversations with a lot of other individuals in Northern Nigeria who feel passionately about this country who would like to see a much more open society, a much more transparent society, um, not one held hostage by religious, uh, uh, you know, religious claims. Because it is quite an irony that Zamfara State today ended up being almost the epicenter of, you know, of bandit. Yet we forget that Zamfara State, when they created Sharia, adopted Sharia law, are not able to resolve the fact that if it is the center of banditry today, yet are they saying that this is what Sharia law is all about? Because by now we should be seeing, you know, a much more reformed society. And Northern Nigeria, please don't forget, and please indulge me here, because it's history. In 1990, when Gideon Oka staged his school, I was in London in the home of, 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 of uh, my good friend, Eddie Iro, and we monitor all the developments. And you know better than myself, that the reason why Gideon Oka's school failed was because Gideon Oka said he's going to excise what was contaminous with the 12 northern states. The rest of Nigeria rose up in unison. We didn't want that to happen. But guess what? Fast forward, barely 10 years later, in 1999, by 2000, all the 12 northern states had decided to proclaim adopt Sharia law by it literally reinforcing exactly the same contradictions that Gideon Oka had espoused that the rest of us had said no to. So my view is that I think we've lost him. If you can still hear us, uh, it appears that we've lost connection with uh, the bishop, but we're trying to reach him on another line and he'll be joining back in a few minutes. Uh, it's the challenge of living and working in, in Nigeria where, okay, I think, he's, I think he's coming back on now. So please give us a few minutes and he'll be back on. Welcome back. I think we lost you for a Hello, Pyro. I'm here. Yes, welcome back. I apologize to our Thank viewers, you. but that's, that's what it means uh, living and working in Nigeria, that the internet can go off at any time. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so you were speaking about the uh, Gideon Oka's coup. Yes, we... yes, yeah. I was just saying that you know, it, we, 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 need, we need to buckle up to work much harder 
because uh, the way that Nigerians rose up to protect the unity of the country has the northern political elite decided hypocritically, deceitfully, to adopt Sharia law, which they knew that beyond its political exigence, it, it was absolutely not something that they themselves expected to live by. Now we are paying the we are paying the price, and you must connect all that. Hello, sir. Can you can you hear me now? Is he in? I can see him though. Yeah, I'm so yeah. I'm so sorry about it. No, it's uh, it's the reality of uh, living and working in Nigeria. So we'll still make the best of it. All right. So maybe maybe just to wrap up the conversation around you know the the Gideon Oka issues and Farah State and Sharia because I think it's an important conversation. 
Yeah, because, you know, I mean, we need to resolve the issues of democracy. Democracy cannot thrive. It's just an option. It's out of the, one of the many options. We could have opted for theocracy or plutocracy, a range of options, but we've opted for democracy as a nation. And I think that everybody from East, West, North, South, Christian, Muslim, whatever may be your identity, it has to be negotiated within this matrix of what it means to live in a democracy. And that means a quantum of rights that should be known to everybody. And, and, and so, yes, people have their own religious aspirations, but you cannot be trying to build a democracy while subverting it by wanting to create a theocracy, you know, whether it's, it is in installments. Because I think that we have, there's no way we can run away from the fact that there is a direct correlation. Because Boko Haram simply is saying, you guys say you want to create a, a, you know, an Islamic state, you fail to do it. Now we are proving to you that we can do it better. We can do it better by killing people. So if you were making all these statements, whether, no matter how uh, small the window may be, it is that that window is not being exploited. So I'm making the point that going forward, Nigerians must be in a position to interrogate anybody who has claims you know, to be their president, to be their governor. They must interrogate his or her antecedents to ensure that we can entrust you with our common welfare. And that is not as if you become president or governor and you suddenly realize that our votes are important, but our faces are not important to you. Because really, for me, the challenge for us as a nation is our inability to manage diversity. And it, it is, I'm not saying anything that is different. It's not impersonal. The record of the president have left us in a quandary as to what we mean by diversity. I, I think it also raises other questions. Um, democracy in Nigeria is a bit jaundiced because of the way it's set up, where people with a lot of resources can buy their way into office without paying any heed to what the electorate care about or where the electorate is. That brings me to another question which you had raised initially in you know, one of the other questions we raised about corruption. You do a lot of work in the Niger Delta and the Niger Delta has been in the news lately um, with the way the Niger Delta Development Commission um, has been managed. What is really difficult for some of us to comprehend is the deafening silence of the elites in the region, people who have always spoken up in the past, some of their statesmen and leaders or people in office or people who arrogate to themselves as you know, being statesmen, um, and also even the militants. So what is going on in the Niger Delta that when it's been brought to the fore that their common wealth seems to have been misappropriated by a small elite, that the people have not risen in one voice to say that this is not acceptable? Why should they? Is there any single place in this country, any single unit from local government to state to federal, where accumulation has been is, exists and the predatory instincts of the elite are not active. The Niger Del, you know, I mean, I don't, first of all, our politics clearly, brutally suggests it is our turn to eat. We expect, mm. we expect people in public life not to come back empty handed. We have not even come anywhere close. That is why I think that this, this, this talk about fighting corruption is an oxymoron, is a redundant concept. I don't think that the framers themselves expect to be taken seriously. That is why after election, people felt that we sold you a dummy that we were going to fight corruption. So now here we are. The Niger Delta, my, my understanding from talking to people and all the time I was working there is that, look, the Niger Delta people feel that, look, I mean, we've, we've earned every right. Because the country is sound, it's a band of thieves. Governance is a criminal enterprise. So what is wrong with our own little criminals participating in this whole thing anyway? Is it that it's not happening in Kano, in Jigawa, in Kainakwa? Is, it, is there any state? Is it not happening? Is there any state or any local government unit that it's not happening? It's happening everywhere. And as it is with corruption in Nigeria, you catch a thief and he says, is it this small thing that I've told you that you are complaining about? So it is that this country does not have the moral radar 
to deal with the issues of corruption because we have not even come anywhere close to appreciating the complexity of the kind of waters that we are in. So if you ask the first of all, the good thing about Niger Delta thing is that it is theatrical. We know that nothing is going to happen, that no matter what they say or anybody says or anybody does, people will keep their jobs. They will, will turn the next page and turn over and watch Arsenal or watch Liverpool and then just bring, take the next you know, uh, bottle of cognac and move on. So nothing is going to happen. So why do you continue to be optimistic? Because everything we've discussed so far, if, if I were to be a young person, listening in i i mean the, the obvious thing for me to think of right now is how do i escape to canada or even to ghana so why why should i continue to believe that there is hope uh, that nigeria will someday find itself on the right course and move forward why look i am optimistic because i'm a, a priest i'm a christian i believe in the redemptive power of but I, I don't if, look. I don't think where we are now is the worst, the worst uh, place to be in. It may not be the best place to be in, but it's definitely not the worst place to be in. Secondly, we are passing through a phase, um, and because we are largely a semi-primitive society, please don't 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 get carried away by a few people who are driving crazy cars and all that, and drinking the most expensive champagne. That's not what. That's not who we are. We still have less than 20% of our people that are bankable. We still have almost 60, 70% of our people living in rural areas. So if I were a young Nigerian, all I will now need to do is to know that politics, all these uh, state initiatives are largely enterprises for, you know, one-handed bandits. I'm not gonna go there. And there are a lot of young Nigerians today who are not being sung, but they are there. They are making a living. They are using their brains. They, their tribe may not be large, but that's where my hope lies. I see young Nigerians who are turning their back on a thoroughly corrupt state, who are changing their state test, changing their expectations, redefining what life is. My, my heart goes out to the little young girl, 24 years old fighter pilot who lost her life. Though that for me, that's the future. The future is not in people. Some of us, I mean, we, are, we are heading in the other direction. But really, for me, the future is not what I see now. And what I continue to encourage young Nigerians is to look at a different blackboard. Not that politics is not important, but we can rebuild our society by redesigning the building blocks. They are available mm -hmm. by creating a new set of values. By creating and many, many, many Nigerians now who have stolen money from this country, some they are hard earned money, who have sent their children abroad to go and study, they are living in humongous houses. They now find that, ironically, their children who went to Oxford, Cambridge, have encountered people who really have money. And they are also having a crisis of conscience about the nature of the wealth of their parents that they can't account for. And for many of them, the wealth of their parents is an embarrassment. Many of those young people are coming to terms with other young people who want to go to Afghanistan, they want to go somewhere else. I met young girls in Harvard, I was shocked. They told me they were going to Malawi and I said, well, they were standing on the streets and begging. And I said, what are you begging? They look pretty, they look well-dressed. I decided to confront them. Why are you begging? And they said to me, well, we want to go to Malawi. And I said, to go and do what in Malawi? We hear that, that young people are falling victims of HIV AIDS. I was a student at the Kennedy School that time. I said, so why are you going to Malawi? Why are you begging? They said, well, the law of one of the courses that we have taken about volunteering, the law says that you cannot take money from your parents. You have to earn the money. So we have to earn our money either by washing cars or doing other things. For a kid to be in Harvard from Asia, your father must have a lot of money. So if those, for me, that's where the world is going. And a lot of our young people, Many Nigerians, who, who a lot of these criminals and bandits who are still in the country blind, will live in eternal shame because their children will not want to be part of the loot that they have stolen. So, and yeah. I think that if we can create, and we are creating a new narrative in which people begin, young people begin to see service as the uh, ultimate uh, uh, end of their life, you know, we definitely have a future. So I'm not looking at a future in terms of the quality of politics that is being played now. 
And I think that 20 years from now, you're going to have slightly a completely different conversation about the context of Nigeria's politics. And talking about young people, every time we have this conversation, in my mind, I see that you know it's a reference to young people in southern Nigeria, more predominantly, because we have this heavy weight up north of you know maybe 10.5 million little kids out of school, or even a more fundamental system, the Amajeri system, which you have written a whole lot about. Um, if you can help us unpack what it means, the origins of it, and what can be done to reform that system without it losing the core essence, you know, for why it was put in place in the first place? You know, that's talk for another day, but I have <laughs> pain in my heart, a lot of pain in my heart, because I know that there are, God knows how many Einsteins, Albert Einsteins are working on the streets of Nigeria as Almagiris and so forth. I can tell you my own personal stories. Then as noted, I, I run a school in, uh, in Katsina State, in a place called Malofashi. And we had, and for me, it's a beautiful story. So if you, if you, if you just permit me. And we had, I had these um, two young children. They had the best result in, in Katsina State. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, okay. They had the best result in, you know, in Katsina State. So when the Reverend Sister who was running the school came and told me that, look, this is what has happened and that these kids were called to Abuja, they were given prizes. So I was very excited. So I called the governor of Casina State, fantastic gentleman, what, what, you know, whatever anybody else may say. I, I called him and I said, look, I would like to come and see you. Uh, and please, and he said, okay, when? And I, you know, we agreed on the appointment. And because of my relationship with him, I said, look, please receive us in a big room you know, where you can receive about 10 people. He said, okay. Now I took these kids. My idea was these kids, their parents, their principal to go and meet the governor. I knew that the sight of government house will excite the parents and excite the children. So I presented these children to the governor. The governor received us very warmly. Now, and I told him, I said, look, this, this is what these kids have done, a boy and a girl. Now, the governor was very happy. And I said to him, please, governor, I'm begging you for a favor. Can you please help me give these children a scholarship each? And the governor said, Bishop, no problem. I'll give them scholarship, I promise. Now, I was very excited, but the punchline in this was, and I waited until the end to tell the governor that these children from a Catholic school were both Muslims. But I, I wasn't seeing them as Muslims. I'm making the point that, look, we started this digital education program. All of a sudden, some crazy crank from somewhere said, Bishop Kuka wants to give education to 10 million Almajiri children. And by extension, he wants to convert them to Islam. And if you follow the, the social media, if you follow, if you follow the social media, you know the result. But guess what? I haven't closed that chapter because all these characters are arguing is, look, it's a pile of rot there, but it is our own. We generated it. Don't touch it. It belongs to us. Mm -hmm. And we use it to manure our politics. So leave us with it. Now, guess what? I'm working now, and maybe I should tell you openly. I'm working now with my good friend, Leo Stan Eke. And by the grace of God, before this year runs out, we're going to come out with, a digital, uh, with digital tools to continue with this project. Because I am convinced that, yes, you make the point that the children we're talking about are Southern children. But I can tell you there are long, young children in Northern Nigeria, exceptionally brilliant with all their skills. Our responsibility and our duty is to see that we open the doors of opportunity for them. Constant, I mean, presently, the tradition is holding them down. And like everybody now knows, for many politicians who are not innocent of this, these children are nothing other than just commodities of exchange, you know, for their political ambition. Uh, we will not resolve the problem immediately, but I think that if the if the governors of Northern Nigeria open up for us, for people like myself and a lot of other, you know, for the Catholic Church, I can speak for the Catholic Church. We've been in education from the beginning. We we taught the world how to run universities. So this is something I'm very passionate about. It will uplift me, but uh, I'm sorry that a lot of people are turning it into politics. But I believe that um, 
In Northern Nigeria, there are a lot of young children with exceptional skills. And by the way, Dr. Okibo, if you know anybody who has a bit of money that can uh, help me build my schools, please, you know, tell them to give me a call through you. <laughs> you, you, have, you have all the rich friends, eh? but uh, I'll take that to heart. Um, I have another related question, you know, which is really about the demographic um, bomb, you know, again in Northern Nigeria. Yeah, in many of your writings, you talk about, you know, maybe the youth in northern Nigeria getting to the top of the ladder and realizing that they've run out of any wrongs, you know, to place their feet on. Um, so we, we live in a country where, uh, you know, we've got about universities produce about 350,000 graduates every year to join the queue of maybe another 30 million graduates who haven't gotten any jobs. And in 2018, we were only able to create about 450,000 jobs in Nigeria. So we have a real big uh, youth bulge, not creating enough jobs to engage them. But we have a counter problem, which is that Nigeria is becoming um, one of the major capitals for small arms and light weapons. Yeah, um, the United Nations estimated that there are about 350 million small arms and light weapons in Nigeria. Some of these weapons you can buy for as little as 30,000 Naira, you know, for a refurbished AK-47, and you're in business. Stand on any major highway, kidnap anybody, and you make multiple returns on that investment. How do we defuse this bomb? It is clear that, you know, maybe our leaders uh, have run, okay, our office holders have run out of ideas on how to handle this. What's your understanding of the challenge, and how do we begin to solve it? You know, sometimes I get so angry that I just said, I'd like to be president of Nigeria, you know, but I know nobody's going to elect me. People will elect, people will elect me, but um, Nigerians will do what they do best, although I'm not available. But frankly, Pius, let me tell you, I have reflected on this story, on this country. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country. One of the sources of my hope is the greatness of this country. And believe me, contrary to what people think, it is not a difficult country to govern. We have not been able to develop a strategy of communication. We've not been able, right now, we do not have, uh, can, you do, can you think of any speech that any Nigerian president has ever given that you can remember the contents from independence till date? A speech of the quality of the Getters Box speech, for example, mm. or Abraham Lincoln's House Divided speech, mm. or Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, or Mandela's Revenue Trial speech. You know, you can lift people up. By, it's not, you know, our politicians keep talking a lot of, I'm sorry to say, rubbish by thinking that democracy is about awarding contracts to themselves, pretending to building roads, building. This is, democracy is not about infrastructure. It's about triggering an intangible feeling in a human being to say, you know what, I can actually touch the moon. It is, it's not impossible. We can get these children to drop their arms. If we, even if we use Nollywood well, even if we develop a strategy, ask yourself, have you ever watched a single Nigerian movie that you felt you would like to be like this, that, or the other actor or actress? When I spoke at Wale Shoyinka's 80th birthday a few years back, one of the things I said was, look, people like Wale Shoyinka have done extraordinarily well. But in my view, and I was just testing the water, I'm not, the literature is not my subject. But I said, what we have had so far, Chino Achebe, all these wonderful writers, we've had cases of what I call art imitating life. Mm. And that is why you read any of their novels, you can identify yourself with any of the characters. And I say the next challenge for Nigerian literature is for us to have a literature in which life imitates art, which mm. is that you can look at Hollywood and you imagine that every marriage ends in pain. Everybody lives happily ever after. It's not so. That you can create a world that is not here by just sheer imagination, that people would like to be like. If you ask yourself, for example, isn't it possible for us to make this country so attractive that people like my friends in the South who have shipped their children to Canada and other places, and indeed for me, I worry about them as much as I worry about the Almagiris, 
Because the fact of the matter is that for every child in the South, better educated, well to who is out there, their space will be taken by somebody else, perhaps not adequately equipped. So we need to create a narrative in which there is a certain level of believability. So I don't think our situation is complicated. I just think that those in power must learn to use the skills of those who have the ability to effectively communicate drama and theater. Let me put it that way, because we can put these guys carrying guns out of business. Somebody has glamorized guns and they have found them attractive. Somebody can glamorize the pen, the way it was done in the fifties and all the things that got us to school. So it's a question of retrieving and creating nobility around education, around intellect and so on and so forth. For me, that is really one of our greatest default lines. So in many of your essays, you've argued that, you know, Christians should adopt nonviolence in response to, you know, some of the violence uh, that may be, you know, religion uh, instigated and so on. Um, how do you push that narrative for a people who have come to realize that the state does not have monopoly on violence anymore, that the state may not be able to protect them. How do you push that narrative that they should just lie back and take what comes to them without arming themselves to protect themselves, mindful of the fact that as each group arms up, the scale and the intensity of the violence escalates. What is the argument for communities that feel that they may be at risk to still say to them, adopt a nonviolent uh, approach? No, I'm not, I'm not preaching absolute pacifism. No, I've never, I have believed it. the principle is there, the principle of self-defense is there. I'm not preaching to anybody that if somebody got into your house to attack you, you should just lie and let them walk all over you. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I think that we as Christians, you know, they, we cannot rewrite the gospels. And we cannot pretend that somehow Jesus didn't know what he was saying when he said, if you are on one cheek turn the other. I had a pastor say a few days back, you know, Jesus, if you are slapped on one cheek, turn the other. Uh, but I have been slapped on two cheeks, so I have nowhere else to turn. <laughs> this is a trivialization of the superiority. No, this is a trivialization of the superiority of moral authority. And I think uh -huh. all you need to do is to very carefully and painstakingly listen to Mandela, listen to M Martin Luther King, and most importantly, read the text of the Bible effectively. Please don't forget, don't forget that when I've reflected on Christianity and I'm saying to myself, we worry as Christians that, oh, Christians are not holding positions of power. In real, when Christianity grew under persecution, under blood, under fire, there was not a single Christian who was a counselor in the Roman Empire, not one. But Christianity was able to grow because of the moral force of nonviolence. So for me, it, it, these are uncharted waters. I understand that we're living in very turbulent environment. I also understand that there are historical explanations for why Islam, especially in Northern Nigeria, can produce something like Boko Haram and all this banditry because Christianity and Islam don't have the same template in terms of history. The Holy Prophet of Islam was a commander Okay, his profile and the profile of Jesus are two uh, completely different. Um, yeah. Islam was established in its present form in northern Nigeria by the sword. A lot of people find, still have reflexes of those things, and that is why. So when when Boko Haram takes up the sword and says, "You don't become a Muslim, we're going to kill you because one will be a caliphate." The, our kingdom is not of this world, and I have no apology to render to anybody about the superiority of moral force. So I believe also finally that, look, where we are now is not, I repeat, it's not the worst part of the earth. I believe that when all is said and done, and when all that has been done has been said, we will come to terms with the fact that like everything else, this phase of our life will pass. But we must preach this gospel, welcome or unwelcome, because I believe that nonviolence holds a superior uh, you know, moral code to violence. Can, can I read, explore a thought that you had and you shared in an interview that was 
reported in the Catholic News Service on February 12th of this year. Um, you complained, you know, on the impression uh, perpetrated by the Buhari administration that one had to be a northern Muslim than a Nigerian to hold a key and strategic position in Nigeria. Then you said, and I quote, the time has come for Christians to have a stronger, broader voice in government so that the challenges of poverty and violence can be overcome. Now, playing the devil's advocate, um, this can be seen as some sort of a dog whistle to Christians and may be seen as perpetuating the identity politics we already have in Nigeria. How would you respond to that claim? Look, it's very simple. And Christians have to answer a question. Are you a Christian who is a politician or are you a politician who is a Christian? All right, let me repeat. Are you a Christian who is a politician or are you a politician who is a Christian? If you notice in my writings, I have never spoken much about Islam, but I've spoken about Muslims. I've never tried to talk about theology of Christianity. I've spoken about Christians. That is at the level, at the manipulative level of how people instrumentalize religion for agendas that have very little to do with the faith itself. That's really where we are. So the point I'm making is I'm saying to Christians, if you find yourself in these positions, what is the use? I have no, no traction for anybody who wants to be president on the, on the platform of Christianity. If all you want to do is to continue with the same bad habit of corruption and turning the state into a distribution agency. It doesn't, it doesn't appeal to me. And I'm not asking that Christians should be here so that we can continue with all the bad things that I'm not blaming anybody because he's a Muslim. No, I'm saying, and in fact, let me even make the point to you very clearly that people used to say to me, you know, you don't like PA, you, you, I mean, you don't like the APC government. Some of my opponents say, ah, you are PDP. And I said, strange enough, I have actually more friends in this government who are, who are in APC than people who are in PDP. But guess what? Whichever side of the coin this turns, I will always be somewhere anyway, because I have I've maintained a certain level of moral uh, uh, you know, rectitude in terms of dealing with these options. So the point I was making to Christians is, if you want to validate the position of your being a Christian, then you must be seen as a Christian who is in politics, not a politician who is a Christian. Because mm. what that happens then is that political party affiliation becomes far more important to you than the values and principles that you espouse. Because if we had this, we would not be dealing with the problems of, 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 of religious, religious identity. Because essentially, when Nigerians worry about these positions, whether they are in or out, is because they want to be at the, at, the, at, the, at the platforms that offer the best opportunity. For example, when appointments were made in 1999, Ohane Zendi said, why, have the, why has Obasanjo given us Yeye Ministries? Okay, the Ipos complained, they got Yeye Ministries because my friend of blessed memory, Ojoma Duke was made Minister for Culture, uh, somebody else was Minister for, 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 for Information. Now, these were Yeye Ministries because they did not have the capacity to deploy the proceeds of corruption. Uh, minister for works or customs or whatever. So we are not asking for opportunities to continue with the bad things. We are asking for that if our people are in power, whether they are Christians or Muslims, they must bring the principles of their faith to governance. Bishop, we should be ending by six o'clock, but given that we lost some time to technical difficulties, if you can permit me another 10 minutes uh, so I get through a few more questions. Um, you, you're part of a number of uh, uh, you know, inter-religious dialogues, you know, in the Vatican City, in the Bishops' Conference. What's the kernel of it? You know, how do we build a society where different religions can coexist? You know, I'm actually looking at maybe a society like the Yorubas have, where they are, first of all, more cultural than the, the religion itself. You know, how do we get to a stage where we have Nigerians who are more Nigerian first before religion. I suspect that those are some of the types of issues that you handle in, you know, in the interdenominational conference. You know, I mean, dialogue is what, 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 what the word is, dialogue, which is just talking. 
talking is not working and working is not action in terms of getting issues. Part of the problem is that I have noticed that the government, gov you know, government in Nigeria like to see dialogue purely as a, an appeasement strategy, you know. So they call on religious leaders. Our responsibility is to make sure that we tell our people to be calm, to pray for government. Even in this dialogue, sometimes I annoy people by saying, I feel like opting out because I'm involved in a certain level of complicity. Maybe I should step aside and let the Nigerian leaders face the wrath and anger of the people that they are oppressing and pauperizing every day. Mm -hmm. Now, dialogue cannot be an excuse for some of the bad things that are going on. Now, in the final analysis, it depends on the kind of policies that a government puts in place. Because, you know, people often may not be conscious of their identities, but they become conscious of those identities depending on how people, I mean, those in, 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 in power, positions of power operationalize this. If you have three children, for example, or four children, two boys and two girls, or three boys and two and one girl, or whatever, your children will be looking out. If they notice that every time you're going out is this child that you take, the boy or the girl, after some time, they will have to find, you'll have to find a reason to explain to them, they are all your children. But we are already suggesting to them that either this one, because he's a man or he's a woman or because he's tall or because he's bright, there must be a reason. Now, so the issue is if a government does not create, it's the business of government to create an environment where people feel a sense of equality. Tragically, um, some of our states are literally miniature theocracies, you know, uh, where people have made it look as if if you don't belong to a particular religion, or if you don't belong to a particular ethnic group, it may be ethnicity here, yeah, maybe religion here, then you are not in. And as you know, exclusion and inclusion are fundamental to how a society organizes itself. So the dialogues are important, but they are not a substitute for good governance. And my argument is that usually I shy away from government-sponsored dialogues because um, government always likes to teleguide what the outcome will be. Yeah. Um, and some of us have always not found much favor because uh, government believes they like their own dialogue partners. And I've always argued, I argue with Khan under Jonathan, I've argued with uh, other religious organization in different circumstances. We are not the praying wing of the party in power. That's not <laughs> our job. <laughs> But it is very simple for a person in, with, like myself to be involved in dialogue. And these people just like to make you their messenger. And before you know what is happening, you become, you are literally co-opted and you are the one literally that is praying for their well-being. I remember one governor saying, saying to, 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 you know, to pastors, if you, if you remain very stubborn, I will find, I will create my own pastors. Uh, because that's the way politicians, uh, you know, they, they, they like things to be. The, the, this discussion actually raises another question, um, especially, you know, on the Ogoni cleanup. Okay. More than 10 years, lots of pro promises made. From where we sit, we haven't seen a lot of progress. Some of us believed that it was going to happen because of the integrity of your person. Um, what is happening? Have you been used as a, 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 a means of giving it credibility and it has fallen into the same trap that Nigeria is in? Um, well, let me tell you that uh, I'm, I'm just, I've just finished the manuscript uh, and you're the first person I'm telling this to on my experience in Ogoni land. I think hopefully COVID permitting, it should, the book should be out Maybe at some point next year, just telling my own story. It's really used at all because of the person I worked with and the people I worked with. I worked with President Obasanjo, and as you will see in the book, his heart and his mind were in that project. I worked with Dr. Peter Odili, his heart and his mind was in that. And you will see from the work that we did and that the president of Nigeria, at my invitation, 
flew to Port Harcourt two different times to visit Ogoni land and so on. Now, I think after Odili left, we worked with Amechi very well. But then by the time Amechi joined APC, APC then, of course, it became, the, the whole thing about cleanup became almost like a campaign slogan. I was invited by the former minister for environment, uh, my good friend, uh, Mrs. I mean, I'm I'm Mohammed. Mohammed. Uh, yes, uh, and, and we went for the, for, the, for the launch of the cleanup of Ogoni land. The first false start was that the president didn't turn up. Um, at that point, I had already exited the process. But I am mightily grateful to God. It's not something I should say. I'm, I am very proud, let me put it that way, of the record that we left in terms of the quality of the work. Now, we managed to, pro to get UNEP to come and work in Ogori land. UNEP did a fantastic job on the 11th of uh, August, or is it for the 11th of August, uh, 2011, no, 4th of August, 2011, UNEP handed in their report to the president. Now, in my comments, I deliberately made a statement on that day. And I said to the president, I am handing you a medical report for their sick child that you asked me to take to the hospital. I'm not in a position to tell you where, where to buy the drugs and when to buy the drugs, but the report is here, the rest is yours. So I don't feel used because we, we accomplished a fantastic job. Uh, what the government has decided to do with it, the integrity of government hangs on that. And for that, I have absolutely nothing to say. Okay, maybe, you know, second to the last question, your good friend, John Campbell, um, wrote a book, Dancing on the Brink. Uh, in one of your earlier comments, you said the end of this uh, Buhari administration will see probably the end of that class of 1966, you know, that we have had to work with these many years. But one might also argue that it's that same class that has pulled us back from the brink every time we dance too close to it. They might have their problems, but they also have a way of resolving issues when it gets to uh, ahead. Do you think that we are prepared to move forward as a nation, given that there is not enough that binds us as Nigeria? Have we built enough of those relationships across the different divides? such that when we again dance close to the brink, that we do not tip over. Well, look, I mean, uh, I thought you were talking of John Campbell. I was on a webinar with, with him, uh, is it last week or maybe, no, I think a fortnight ago. He's actually writing a, a, new, a new book, uh, questioning the notion of Nigeria as a nation state, but that's a different thing altogether. Look, democracy is a substitute for government by whispers. Um, that is all this nocturnal thing that we pull Nigeria out of this. Who are we? I have said to people, look, biology is helping us because the transition, we never had a transition in Nigeria, but biology is helping with the transition. So once that generation gets too tired, too weak to cause trouble, we require a new spring of politicians, and a lot of them are there and they're waiting you know, to change this conversation. So for me, it's not about we, we, oh, we dance close to the brink and somebody is pulling us back. And please, there are no perfect moments, okay? There are no perfect moments. So it's not as if we are probably waiting for somebody to tell us when are we going to be ready? Well, you know, Nigerians keep saying we are not ready. They want to have a conversation about restructuring. They say we are not ready. But how is it that when it comes to stealing, we started stealing from day one? <laughs> who, who trained us for that? So it, it, for me, uh, governance is about making mistakes and the, the coming generation picking up the rubble and improving on that. And every generation fulfilling its dreams and its vision. There are no perfect finishing posts. So the illusion that some of us have that somehow we are going to come to a point sooner than later in which they are, you're going to have everybody ready for democracy. It never works that way. I think a measure of the strength of our democracy is that with all the shenanigans that have happened, things that ordinarily in the 80s would have been reasons for a coup, 
that all these things, these distortion, these convulsions, these contradictions, these inefficiencies have happened and Nigeria is still standing and nobody has surreptitiously called for the military to take over power and the military has not even attempted a failed coup. Is a measure of the fact that even the soldiers themselves realize that military coups are no longer welcome. So this is like a Catholic marriage. You know, <laughs> we may not be very happy, but it is not going to end. It's not dissolvable. You know, so we just have to keep working. And that is why political speeches, presidential speeches, how people react in moments of sorrow, in moments of tragedies, all these are opportunities for leaders to say to people. Never mind, it's going to be fine. You will be everything. It's, and I'm not just making, you know, making this up, but that we have to continue to remind ourselves that tomorrow is going to be better than today. If not, there is no reason for us to leave. You know, so and I think that the tragedy is that we've not had a political class that has taken very seriously the issue of speech making and speech writing and much more effective communication of. Uh, a message to our people. This is why we are not the most sorrowful people in the world. As you can see, Nigerians are still getting on with their lives because they have switched off government. I was the other day, I, I was with a friend of mine and I said, I turned the, the, the you know, it was nine o'clock and I said, let's, let's, let's listen to the nine o'clock news. And this is a serious Nigerian, a rich Nigerian, a big Nigerian. The man says to me, what are you watching NTA for? It's more than 10 years since I, I, I watched NTA. Now, people tell you everybody has abandoned those. It, it shouldn't be the case. But that's because people mistakenly think that propaganda is substitute for giving people information. Propaganda is a function of illegitimate democracy. People should be able to access government information much more effectively, as opposed to having a group of people who say, our business is to communicate what government is doing. And as you know, the more it comes from government, the less likely it is that Nigerians will believe you. So, I mean, we are, we are, we are on this road and there is no reverse gear. Your Excellency, Matthew Hassan Kuka, Bishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Sokoto, I thank you so much for making time to join me in this conversation. I am sure we have not covered all the issues you know, that we set out to cover, but it's you know, one hour and it's gone so fast. I thank you for coming and hopefully we'll find some time on your calendar to bring you back to continue the conversation. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, but please, Pius, do me the honor. Don't call me your excellency. There's only one excellency in Sokoto. I'm in Kaduna, there's only one excellency, please. I am just Bishop Puka. So don't call me your excellency. But on a more serious note, Pius, thank you for the great work you are doing. Congratulations on going to Harvard. And uh, I don't want to waste your time, but actually because of a huge tribe of Nigerians who have gone to Harvard, who have gone to Yale, who have gone to Oxford, who have gone to Cambridge, that is why it is a mortal sin that we have not been able to change this country. So when you come back, let's do this again, but the future is ours to make. Thank you very much and God bless you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.